Hello art historians and welcome to the second part of our lecture over the Arabic Islamic Empire and the art that came with it. So when we last left our story, we were looking at the ways that when Islam spread out, um, it really started to adopt from other places. And then we looked at how as it became more of an empire, the art and architecture are really going to change quite a bit from being more religiously focused to being much more secular in nature to kind of celebrate the emperors or the caliphs that were in charge of the empire because it kind of became a status symbol um, not just a religious mission especially with the influence of persian kings to be the caliph so let's step back through this so we looked at islam when it first spread out of arabia um, moving into like the byzantine empire and the persian empire they're going to adopt from the places that they saw because they didn't really have an artistic tradition of their own then as Islam will spread out um, and expands and becomes an empire, other areas will adopt influence, but will also influence how Islamic art looks. So, for example, we saw that with the Alhambra. We saw that with um, the Mosque of Cordoba. We saw that with the Pyxis of al Mugira. Then Islam becomes, um, as it becomes an empire, remember, especially with the Abbasids, as they move over towards Persia, and the kings, the caliphs kind of become kings and base themselves off Persian rule, we start to see, you know, the art become much more extravagant and a little bit more secular or non-religious in nature. But what eventually is going to happen is the Islamic empire under the Abbasids is going to fall apart. It's going to collapse and it's going to fragment into di little different sections. So, for example, we're going to have um, little caliphates and we're going to have sultanates and emirates and the emirates and sultanates are going to be rulers who are islamic but don't get to rule because they're islamic they they just happen to be an islamic ruler over an islamic country so then as this empire fragments and breaks apart we're going to have other groups that come in who are not arabic who adopt islam and they are going to have previous you know ideas of art and architecture of their own and as a result of that they're going to make their art look a little bit different in nature so we're going to be able to see this in areas, um, for example, like the Ottomans. We looked at the Great Mosque of Selim or Suleiman, which was whenever they came in, those were Turkish Muslims. So the Turks were from Central Asia and kind of migrated through Asia long before the Mongols did. And they went through what I call the Islamic perfume cloud. And when they do that, they take Islam with them, but they also take their own styles and their own backgrounds with them. So the art will start to deviate a little bit. We're also going to see this with the Mongols. We're going to see this in Persia under the Safavid Empire. And we're going to see this under the Mughals, who are actually Mongol Persians, who will take over northern India. So a really, really good example of this, and this is a great piece to start with to do this, is the, the um, basin or the Mamluk Basin. So a little bit of a background um, is the fact that we have um, the Mamluks, who in the Islamic world were actually originally taken as military slaves. And slavery in the Islamic world didn't quite mean the same thing as we envision it in the modern world. It wasn't necessarily about subjugation. Um, it was more of an opportunity, in fact. So if you took someone as a slave, then if they converted to Islam, then they could no longer be a slave and they could actually work their way up and improve their station in life by starting out through slavery. Slavery was more of an opportunity rather than a sentence. So the Mamluks um, were actually slaves who, in the Islamic world, who were military elites, who eventually broke off and founded their own kind of state in Egypt and Syria, particularly in Egypt. Now, originally, the Mamluks were second to the Abbasids, like they knew that the Abbasids were the caliphs over all of the Islamic world. So, but they really knew that the Abbasids were not as military natured as they were, and the Mamluks were really the ones with the most influence, especially coming out of Egypt, which was so close to Iraq and Baghdad. So what we're going to see with this is that this was a group who was very military in nature. They had their own culture long before they came into this area and adopted Islam, and they liked to create goods that a lot of the Arabic Muslims would have been like, okay, we don't do that. And the Turks were like, well, we do do that because we're not Arabic. We're Muslim, but we're not Arabic. So what we see in this basin, right? So this basin was actually created probably as a luxury item. So like for a Mamluk ruler or a Sultan, all right? And on this basin, and I'm going to show you details of it. Okay, I'll kind of go through this a little bit. 
So you can see here that it definitely has the nature motif that's on it. So we can see the arabesques that are running through it. But what may stand out to you the most is that this is an Islamic work of art, obviously. But there's people in it. Those are figures, which we have seen would never have happened previously. And these people do not look in it European. They're wearing armor and hats that were definitely Turkish in nature. And if you look at the scene very closely, there are tons and tons of animals in it, leopards and elephants. You can see that there's monkeys in it. And here this person is stabbing what looks like a, somewhere between a raccoon and a lemur. And then below it, we're actually going to see in some spots in the water, we're going to see like what have been below them, like fish and crocodiles and things that they would have seen on the water in Egypt. So this is definitely a hunting scene. It's not a military scene. It's not a battle, but it gives them a chance to still show off their prowess um, because they're holding spears, bows and arrows, swords, but they're not doing it in a threatening way. They're doing it in a hunting way. So you can kind of see over here like an aardvark looking animal, um, but right next to it, you can see something that almost looks like it doesn't belong there. And that is a French fleur-de-lis. And if you live in St. Louis, you've seen fleur-de-lis everywhere because we were a French city. Um, you also see them in New Orleans with the Saints because New Orleans was the new or city of Orleans over from France. So what happened was, all right, clearly this is not a military scene at all. Like it's a hunting scene. It's a luxury item. In the Islamic world, this probably was used just for hand washing, you know, at best. Or it was a luxury item to show off in a home of a sultan. But the French came in and either bought or took this item of exquisite craftsmanship from the Islamic world, from the Mamluks, either bought it or took it, basically took it back and were like, oh, we took this from the Islamic infidels and they used it in you know, their Islamic function and their Islamic worship, but we're going to use it as a baptistry. Right? So let's go back to that. So they actually used this as a baptismal basin to baptize babies in France. And it's the baptistry of Saint Louis. OK, so the ruler of France at the time. So basically what the French did is they came in and they took it. So the flirt, the flower that was on it was probably a symbol of the Mamluk Sultan because it was part of like their, clo their coat of arms. But the, the French came in and basically turned it into, if you look, a fleur-de-lis, which doesn't actually look like it belongs there. So it's kind of a cultural appropriation, if you will, of twisting this into something that it's not when it actually was an Islamic Good. Now, there is calligraphy on it inside the basin, but it's actually nothing religious whatsoever. It's the artist signing his name six times because apparently he was very proud of this work of art. Um, so it is Islamic. It's from an Islamic place, but it's not religious in nature at all. You can kind of see here the Mamluk tradition of and they look more Central Asian because they are, you know, from Central Asia in their appearance. Okay, so we're going to step through this real quick because we're going to move eastward um, out of Egypt past Saudi Arabia where Islam began. And we're going to move into Iran or what is today Iran, but was originally Persia. So we're going to start by looking at a little bit of a timeline. I'm going to step you through this as it progresses. And you'll notice that um, Iran means land of the Aryans, which those were the people, the Aryans were the group that came into um, India initially and brought the Vedas with them that will become Hinduism that kind of established the caste system there. Okay, so this doesn't move as fast as I would like it to, unfortunately, um, but, and I can't fast forward a whole lot or it'll just completely mess it up because the screen gets in the way. So this is the original area, early civilization. Now we see the Persian Empire. And you can see that we've talked about this in our early civilizations. It will encompass Mesopotamia. That's where they adopt a lot of the Mesopotamian art styles. Like we see the Lamassu in the um, uh, Gate of All Nations. They make it all the way to Greece and then kind of get turned back at the Persian Wars, which is right about now, actually, on the timeline, because this is when Greece starts to really get full of themselves because they won. And we see the Achaemenid Empire, which is under, you know, that's the very first true Persian Empire in their capital city being Persepolis. So here comes Alexander the Great, as you can see him here in the mosaic, and you can see that now it's gone. So after Alexander the Great dies, his empire breaks up into three sections. So you have the Greek section, you have um, the Persian section, and then you have the Egyptian section, which Egypt will be ruled by the Ptolemies, which is 
the pharaohs for a very long time who are Greek. In fact, Cleopatra was part of that. The Seleucid Empire you see here is basically the remnants of Alexander the Great's conquest over this area. And you can see the capital city, Hecatom Hecatompolos, Pilos, I can't even say it right because it's too hard. That's a Greek name. So right about now, Persia, would have, you notice they hit kind of a wall and they kind of stay here. That's because Rome is around at this point. So the Roman Empire would have been butting up like right against this at that point. And so now we're after the rule of Caesar Augustus. Persia is still kind of kept at bay, kind of isolated. You can see Armenia there, which was a Christian area. If you've heard of the Armenian Genocide. I promise we're not going all the way through this timeline, just the important parts that are relevant to what we're going to be talking about. As you can see, for a very long time, Parthian Empire, obviously. All right. This is the Sassanid Empire, which is going to be the empire that highly influences um, the Abbasid Caliphate in the way that the Persian kings ruled. And this is going to be um, where we're going to see, like, this just great period of flourishing culture in the Persian Empire. It's also where we're going to see the Ewan type of palaces develop because they were huge and very influential. And that's what the great mosque of Isfahan in Iran is based off of. And you can see there was Armenia there and Armenia being Christian would have been allowed to live in peace in this area. Okay, so remember in the 600s, this is when Islam develops. So kind of keep an eye on what we're going to see happen and just how quickly the Islamic empire will come in and start to threaten this a little bit. Now notice at this point, they're really getting into it quite a bit with, okay, <laughs> the Byzantine empire. So now we have the Umayyad Caliphate, the military one, and Persia begins to adopt Islam at this point. But notice there's not really much of a huge empire there at this point. They're kind of, you know, struggling. Meanwhile, the Umayyads rule all the way to the west. They rule all the way to Spain. So Persia at this point is not quite the empire that it was anymore. A lot of internal conflict, fighting with the Byzantine Empire, which kind of made them easy for the Islamic world to come in and conquer. You can see down there at the bottom where it's got the Islamic calligraphy because, or the Arabic calligraphy, because this was when they had adopted Islam. Now, at this point, they are ruled by the Mongols. So I want to make sure I pause that for you guys to realize. At this point, they are being taken over by the Mongols. The Mongols come in and actually are going to cause a problem not only in Persia, but they're going to defeat the Abbasids as well. So the Mongols are going to come in and conquer Russia, Central Asia, and China. We talked about with the David bases, and this is where they would have gotten that cobalt blue from to add into the Chinese white porcelain. So you can see it says Il Khanate, like they're one of the Khanates. You can see the Mongols starting to lose power, and the Mongols basically get absorbed into Persia at this particular point. Now, this is the Safavid Empire, which is Turkish, all right? So one of those Turkish groups that are going to come in and take over this area and who will also be Islamic. And they established the Safavid dynasty, which we call a gunpowder empire because they developed this using gunpowder. Now, I'm going to pause it here because this is a very important part of the story. Under the Safavids, they make the decision. Remember, I talked to you earlier about that division between Sunni and Shia Muslims. At this particular point, Iran is ruled by a Shah who makes the decision at the advice of a religious mystic that they are going to decide to be Sufi, not Sufi, excuse me, Shia Muslim. 
Now that is significant and it is significant to this day because by being Shia Islam, they are saying that we want people, because remember your religion is your politics, we want people loyal to us. And if they're loyal to Sunni Islam, they may be loyal to another state like the Ottomans or something like that. But if we're Shia, they are going to be loyal to us. And the Shia are going to do things differently, including their view of how they will show art to kind of separate themselves from the rest of the Islamic world. Okay, so let's pick up with the Mongols moving in. So we had this Persian Empire that adopted Islam, and you get a group of nomads led by Chinggis Khan, who united all of these tribes together um, to become the Mongols, and they were fierce. I mean, they adopted military techniques from everywhere and their siege tactics were incredible. They were very, very brutal and ruthless once they took you over. But once they did rule you over, they were incredibly appreciative of the cultures they took over. They absorbed a great deal of Chinese culture. Um, they were open to Islam, every other religion. And the reason was because their religion was based on their environment. So they didn't think it would make sense to force anybody else to be their religion. And they were very open to other religions coming in and helping them, you know, especially with their knowledge. They loved knowledge. Chinggis Khan, Kublai Khan, his son, you know, his grandson, Ogadai Khan, Kublai Khan. They were all very open to, you know, these other religious mystics that they would consider like Islam. You know, they had a great knowledge of astronomy, which the Mongols really loved and thought that was great. So they were open to all these other cultures. Now, I will tell you, the Mongols were really not very nice to Persia. They had a very long-standing grudge about Persia attacking a Mongol wagon train decades earlier. And they were very, very harsh on Persia, probably the meanest they were to anybody. But eventually, um, one of the things that the Mongols do is they cross-pollinate. And what I mean by that is they were they would take artists and architects from all the different parts of the empire, all the four khanates, and they would move them around and they like to mix different art styles and adopt different art styles and almost write themselves into the history of certain areas. So we're going to really see this in Persia with some of the works of art that they created there. So this is just to show you the four great Khanates. Um, after Chinggis Khan had this entire empire, Kublai Khan, is gonna, his grandson, will extend it all the way into China. And then you have this huge Khanate, but or these eventually these four Khanates, but without one united empire, it caused a little bit of infighting and destruction that will end up leading to their demise. But in the meantime, the Il Khanate is Mongol, Mongol rule over Persia, and the Mongols leveled the Abbasids because the Abbasids refused to submit to them. So that was the thing. If you didn't submit to them, they were just going to wipe you out. So one of the things that is a huge tradition in Persia is called the Shahnameh. And in order to help you remember this, Persia has been ruled forever by the Shahs. And in fact, until the Re Iranian Revolution, they were still ruled by Shahs. If you know anything about the Iranian Revolution, the United States basically helped the Shah of Iran, who was terrible to his own people, which caused them to, he you know, sought asylum in the United States and they took hostages um, for 444 days, I believe, until the day Reagan was sworn into office. So the Shahs are a long part of Persian history, and there were great epic poems that were written by the Persians to remember these kings. And the Shahnameh, and I spelled it wrong here, was this great epic poem talking about the legacy of all these kings. Now, the Persians from the Byzantines had adopted this huge tradition of Persian miniature paintings. And what we mean by that is small pictures that illuminate the writings. OK, so like they were meant to illustrate. And you can see here that this is actually a page from a Shahnameh, but you can tell it would have been made after they adopted Islam. And that's because you have calligraphy there. You have Arabic calligraphy telling the story, even though this is, and you have people in it. This is not something that, you know, the Arabic Islamic world would have done. This is something that Persia has always done. Now, they were very careful. They didn't really show depth. They weren't really concerned with making it look too realistic. It was making sure you told the story. So they really like to tell it from multiple perspectives and multiple sides. So you can kind of see all different stories at once without maybe having the depth of three-dimensional so what you have here is you have a couple things happening. You have Persian miniatures, Persian royalty, and then you have the combination of Islam into that. But we're going to throw this in a little bit more, right? 
So when the Mongols come in, because they literally become, so first they take over Persia, and then they literally become absorbed into Persia. They didn't really, in China, they get kicked out. In Russia, they kind of get pushed aside. In this part of the world, they just kind of got sucked in and kind of became absorbed and almost became Persian themselves. So if they were going to be written into the history, they kind of wanted it to make it seem like they had always been there, like they had this right to be there. So we see in this, all right, so we have the Islamic writing, okay, we have Islamic manuscripts, we have Persian miniatures, and then if you look at this, all right, you have images of people who are riding on horseback, shooting bows and arrows, wearing Mongolian helmets, who have an Asian appearance. That's Mongolian. So they literally wrote themselves into the story and put their faces in the shanama of the you know, place of these the story of these persian kings and then you can see here if you look there's this huge emphasis on nature in it of mountains and trees which would have been something they took from china it's that cross-pollination of chinese landscapes mongols and their conquests in a Persian story, in a Persian manuscript showing Persian figures with Islamic calligraphy. And you can see that it seems to be telling all these stories at once. Like their depth is terrible. They're not going for three dimensional, but it's all different kind of perspectives. So you can tell the story all at one time. So the story that we have for the 250 is Baram Gur fights the Karg, which I know sounds really, really crazy. All right. So this story was from 400 years before this miniature was actually created. So this story is a great part of Persian history. Like, it's a very big part of their story. And it's a monstrous horned wolf that had been terrorizing the countryside. They cried, Your Majesty, this is beyond any man's courage. Tell Shungal this can't be done. So it is a Persian Shah who is killing the Karg or defeating this great enemy and basically showing that you know, this king has brought peace to this, you know, empire. But if you look at this, all right, so you have mountains that aren't very good, you have trees, you have landscape, and then you have a Mongol wearing Chinese silk, right, and a golden hat, which is something they would have seen in Egypt, or maybe Mamluk Egypt, because they did get to that point, the Mamluks actually stopped them from getting into Africa, funny about that. And then we also have, you know, that Chinese elaborate, you know, the gold and all of those pieces. So again, you've got a Persian story with um, Chinese landscapes, Chinese silk clothing showing the wealth of this person, Mongols on horseback with soldiers or with bows and arrows, killing an enemy, basically writing themselves into a story showing that they brought peace to this area. And there is a horse standing on the conquered car. All right. So the Karg is the horn wolf, all right? So that's the, the whole point of this. And the horn wolf is showing, you know, is this big threat that nobody can conquer. And here comes this Persian Shah who is going to defeat it, all right? So the Mongols actually, by putting themselves into this, they are showing themselves as the saviors of the Persian empire, like they saved it. And you'll notice that they don't really work to use atmospheric perspective. Like they're not really trying to create depth because that would create almost too much realism in it. And they don't want it to look like idols. So they are doing that. But then you can see the Arabic calligraphy that is in it. So Baram Gur is this Persian king who is kind of the ideal of what a king should be. Well, in the Mongol world, a king should be a warrior. He should be a victor. And the people used to say, oh, well, they're wanting to be like Europeans. They're wearing European fabric. Nope, that's probably Chinese silk, actually. Um, or it would have been, if anything, European to show that they were just as awesome as they were. There's kind of some disparities on there. But this is a, you know, religious scene. Or, or excuse me, not a religious scene. It's a secular scene. So you could show a figure in this. And the Persians literally, you know, were, had their story hijacked by the Mongols. Now... Let's stay in Iran. Okay, so stay with me. All right, so the Mongols come in and establish the Ilkhanate, and then they get kind of absorbed in, and then we get this other empire called the Safavids, and the Safavids are going to be the ones who make the decision that Persia is going to be Shia Islam, all right? 
So there was a Sufi mystic, and a Sufi is somebody who kind of makes Islam user-friendly. Um, they don't worry about the materialism of Islam. Um, that and They kind of got away from it. They're like, you know what, this Pixis of al Mugira and all this stuff, you guys are kind of losing focus on the message. And the laws, there's so much laws. It should really just be about a person having a relationship with Allah. And the Sufis are the ones who would do the whirling dervishes and drink a lot of coffee and spin around and spin around and have kind of this mystic experience with Allah. So a Sufi mystic actually, you know, helped make the decision that Iran was going to be Shia Islam, not Sunni, which made them distinct. And so your loyalty as a Shia Islamic person meant that you were loyal to the Persians, if anything else. So what this does is it causes, you know, in some ways, some cataclysmic events that separates Persia and or Iran very much from the rest of the world. Again, they're very hostile at times. They feel like they're kind of being picked on a lot, but that's because they're surrounded by Sunni Muslims and they kind of feel threatened and under attack quite a bit. So the Sufi mystic who had founded this, you know, Persia as this Islamic, Shia Islamic state, they created this great place of sanctuary for him in his mausoleum and his tomb, right? And in that tomb, they placed two um, of these huge carpets. And if you know anything about Persian rugs, Persian rugs are extremely expensive. And because they are Islamic and they need the prayer rugs for praying, it was a great, you know, a, a very lucrative profession. So these Ardabil carpets, there's actually two of them, right? And one of them is allowed to travel. And it's a very big step for Iran to let that happen. And Persians were masters at carpet making techniques. And one of the reasons for that is they used a lot of animal wool and a high knot count. And they would do that because the animal fi fibers actually absorb color more brightly. We saw this with the um, Inca Altacapu tunic. And the knot count being so small allows for much more detail. These actually were created by men, whereas, you know, carpets actually used to be more of um, a female's work. This is actually considered to be the world's oldest dated carpet. And it's dated because it had such a huge significance to it. And that date and the people who created it are actually in the, in the knots have actually their names into it. So you can see here, it's very Islamic in nature. It's got the tessellation. It's got the, um, what am I trying to say? The uh, nature patterns for the gardens of paradise. And you can also see that this was meant to reflect that this was for a holy place because it's not a mosque, but it is still a very holy place. So looking at it, if you look at it dead in the center, you can see what almost looks like the lamps that we saw in the Mosque of Salim that hang over people during prayer. And then you also have the two hanging lamps. So kind of give this idea of the carpet itself being part of worship like showing that this is a place of worship even though it's not a mosque this is to remind you that it is a very very holy place because of the person whose tomb it was placed in so i just want to show you guys where the safavid empire is and what basically becomes kind of the, they get into a fight with the ottomans who are right next door who are one of the other gunpowder empires and that actually is, helps define to this day where the Iranian and Arabic world kind of divide. And if you look in the pink, we'll talk about that in a second. That's the Mughal Empire, which was actually Mongol Persian descent. So it's kind of a mix of Mongol Persian Mughal that will go in and take over India. And they are Islamic, and that's going to cause some problems. So this is the tomb of the Sufi Sheikh, Sheikh who um, declares that they are going to be Shia Islam and bring Shia Islam to this area. And this tomb is where the Artabil carpets would have been placed. And you can see that geometric patterns and the tessellation and the calligraphy on the outside. So this is the Artabil carpet. And again, you can see that it almost looks like that lamp right there is hanging down from the chandeliers. And what's crazy about this is they actually have allowed this carpet, one of two, and you can see how big it is, to travel to Britain. Britain allows, they allow Britain to show it, which is a great you know, step of trust for Iran to let this go as sacred as it actually is. So again, it's meant to make you feel like that circular pattern as if you are looking up into a dome, like in an Islamic mosque. And you can see the tessellation patterns. And again, that idea is a paradise. This has 35 million knots in it, or 800 knots per square inch, which allows them to have this incredible 
detail and it was meant to look like the inside of a dome with the hanging lamps and the chandeliers um, and the corners of the rug are kind of like the squinches that a dome would sit on so almost like you are looking up into a dome so like laying on your back even though you're looking down and you're looking up into this dome because it was meant to remind you of what a mosque was like even though you're not in a mosque it conveys that very holy you know what this site is so again in the Quran heaven is a garden of paradise with seven levels of heaven and then the four rivers all right so that just really deflects that idea of the gardens of paradise that we've talked about so much all right And I just want to show you that one of the things that kind of goes back to this is the Persian history, why they would like that so much about this idea of um, nature is remember the Persians at Persepolis and Pasargadae, their palaces, they were able to irrigate in, and bring vegetation to places where there shouldn't have been any. So it kind of almost at the same time parallels the Persian growth and nature and the things that thrive in that empire. So this is actually, you can see it, and it's kept airtight and sealed and very well taken care of. Um, and they only let light shine on it for a very short period of time as not to fade any of the, um, the ink that is in it. Okay, so this is really out of place, and I hate that it is, and I'm sorry about that. Um, so Baram Gur, just to go back to Baram Gur fights the Karg, um, actually refers to a wild donkey. So Gur actually means really swift or really fast. So it's kind of like a compliment to that, all right, and actually the story takes place when Gur visits India, who needs help getting rid of the vicious Karg, all right, and the Karg, the Garmgur kills the Karg with a bow and arrow and then stands on its head before giving it to the ruler of India, so it's almost like a way of showing that they were saving India as well. Now, one of the reasons why the Mongols would have liked this book is because it's portable and it's small, which means they could take it places with them. And to them, that would have been awesome because Mongol culture is typically tr told orally. So this would have given them a chance to show images to that. And again, it's there's some discrepancy on whether he's wearing European clothing or African clothing or if it's Chinese. But either way, it does show that the Mongols had awareness of the world, basically. Okay, so now we are going to move into Safavid Persia. So Baram Gur fights the Karg is Mongols writing themselves into Persian history. But the Persians are also very proud of their own history as well. So we're going to see another Shanama that has the court of the Gayumars in it. And Gayumars is considered to be like the first true Persian king, right? And it's a very important part of the story. So even after the Mongols ruled Persia, these miniatures are going to continue in a big deal and kind of still continue to almost reinforce, especially after the Mongols are gone, that, hey, you know what, um, we're actually Persian. You know, it's we weren't Mongolian, just so you know that. So they would like create a lot of works that were didactic. And what that means is they taught a lesson and could be used for kings to pass on to their sons. All right. So like one Shah to another Shah as far as what their role is supposed to be. All right. Now, because of the fact that Mongolian culture had kind of invaded into Persia, they will still have a little bit of an Asian appearance rather than just solely Persian. Um, but in this particular Shanama, there are 258 pages, and all of them are really non-religious. I mean, they're not really Islamic in nature. There will be calligraphy in it, and there's figures in it, which shows that they definitely weren't following all the rules of the Arabic Islamic world, which may have been on purpose because they were Shia at this point. So this story is uh, the first king of Persia, Gayamars, who, and the story goes, he was enthroned before his people. And in this story, they, they made it small, but with lots and lots of detail, because if there's lots and lots of detail, you have to stare at it longer. And the idea is the longer you stare at it, the more of the story you're really, really going to get. So that's an important part of this. All right. So supposedly civilization was created um, from basically this Persian king, like basically life began with them. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Like these are examples of this. All right. So on the left is more of the one of the Shanama under the Mongols. The one on the right is more under the Safavids, and you can actually even see that the calligraphy looks a little bit different, like it's more Farsi than it's going to be Arabic. Okay, so 
The Shanama, okay, the court of the Gaiamars, this particular Shanama was probably created by a father to pass on to his son as kind of like secular messages of how to rule. So definitely this is not an Islamic thing. Um, it's just made by people who happen to be Islamic, all right? And if you notice, at the very center of it is Shah Gayumar, and it shows that he is important. And you've got all these different scenes going around and all these different perspectives and all these details that people would see the story from different angles, all right, so that they would, and, you know, here is his son learning from his message, and basically they brought life to Persia. Okay, so this is the story, okay, when the sun reached the Lamb constellation, when the world became glorious, when the sun shined from the Lamb constellation to rejuvenate the living beings entirely, it was when Gaia Mars became the king of the world. He first built his residence in the mountains. His prosperity in his palace rose from the mountains, and he and his people wore leopard pelts. Cultivation began with him, and the garments and food were ample and fresh. So basically, it's like, look, this is everything that the first Persian king did. He brought civilization. He brought life. And, you know, this is what you, his successors, should do to kind of follow suit. And again, where it's Islamic is they're not trying to make it look too much like an idol. It can tell a story, but it can't be too realistic. So they're still trying to keep it very two-dimensional, very flat. And you do have that Chinese landscape element that's still part of it, the mountains and the rivers and the vines. So that element never really kind of went away. Now, we talked about the Mughals, all right? So the Mughals moved into India, and they... Because India has that caste system brought in by Hinduism, they've never really been able to unite together because they've never been united really under one person, except for Ashoka, and then it fell apart after him. And the only reason it worked under him is because he promoted Buddhism. So what we're going to see happen here is because they are so ununified, it's very easy for an outside invader to come in and conquer them. And we're going to see this with the Mughals coming in, who are Persian Mongols, who happen to be Islamic, and they come in and they conquer this area and establish this Mughal Empire and begin a dynasty passing rule through. Now, you are, if you're a Mughal, you are a minority ruling over a majority Hindu population that has been Hindu for a very, very long time. And the initial rulers who got into this area knew that, and they were desperately trying to make sure that they didn't offend. And their initial policy, even though Hindus aren't a people of the book, they were going to make sure that they were still respected. And that some of the very early rulers took some great steps to do that. So this is the Mughal Empire. And you can see they rule over pretty much all of India. All right, so that's going to be kind of an issue. Now, the very one of the very first rulers, not the first one, but one of the first rulers of the Mughal Empire was a ruler called Akbar. Right, and Akbar was an excellent ruler. Um, he was very religiously tolerant, and he was desperate to show that all different kinds of faiths were respected in his kingdom or his empire. And he also wanted to show that they were intelligent and they were there were benefits to the Mughals being there. They were aware of the outside world. So what you have here under Akbar is he passed that same idea onto his son Jahangir. Right. And this is a piece called Jahangir, preferring a Sufi mystic to kings. All right, so let's step through this, first of all. Number one, it's definitely of an Islamic people who would read Arabic to, you know, read the Quran. We can see that at the bottom, because that is the Arab Islamic calligraphy that you can see there. The carpet that is obviously, it's supposed to be flat, but it's tilted up. So obviously they're not worried about perspective, because they're still not worried about that. They're not worried about depth very well is that natural patterns, or as you can see, that you know floral vegetative pattern that's very big in the Islamic world. It's a Persian rug, right, because they would have gotten that from Persia, obviously. But then you have around him a huge solar disk that kind of mirrors the one he's sitting on, so kind of like this idea of being the center of the world, basically. And let's talk about the people who are over here. So one of them is going to be a Sufi mystic. And you can see that a Sufi mystic, again, those kind of spiritual religious Islamic leaders, is handing him a gift in a manuscript. And that manuscript, he's actually handing it to him almost with his bare hands. And that is a huge thing because you weren't supposed to touch the hand of the emperor. You weren't supposed to touch some of these religious books with your bare hands. 
but here Jahangir is touching it and he's almost touching it. It's just through some silk, like they're just barely separated. And he's preferring him above an Ottoman Sultan, so you can see down here, who is second because he's also Islamic, but he's not a Sufi mystic. Then you have a European ruler who's most likely King Charles, all right? And King Charles is almost looking at you like he's being rejected from this scene. Like he's not even worthy of getting any attention. He's almost pulling like a gym moment from like the office where he just kind of looks at the camera like, can you believe this? What's going on? He's not really engaged with the scene. But at least Jahangir is aware of what's going on in the world. He knows the European leaders. He just doesn't have much time for them. Like it's not really that important. He's aware of what's going on in Europe in terms of like art movements because that may represent the little chubby angels at the top. And he's sitting on an hourglass, which you can see has to do with like basically time and this ruler. But then down here at the bottom, if you look, that is the artist of this. And the artist is, we know he's Hindu because he's wearing yellow and red. He's wearing colors that are distinctly of Hindu nature. And we know that he's Hindu and he is Indian in appearance. And he's actually holding a little miniature that he painted. And it actually shows in it gifts that we think he received as a result of painting these paintings for Jahangir. So he's being honored as a Hindu. So Akbar, the third king of the Mughal dynasty, so again, not the first, was told by a Sufi mystic that he would have a son. And he did. And that was Jahangir, which means Caesar of the world, which kind of right there was Caesar Augustus kind of did the same thing. And Jahangir was very big on having um, artists follow him and document everything he did. So kind of like early social media presence. Like he wanted people aware of his policies and his feelings towards other religions. So he liked to also show his people that, you know, they were worldly. They were understanding of other cultures, other art movements. The, this king had probably never been there, right? But he probably received, the Jahangir probably received a portrait of him and then had that portrait kind of painted in. And since the portrait wouldn't have shown the side of him, um, they can't really paint the side of him because they don't know what his profile would have looked like. So the halo and the moon around him show he's the light of the world. And England was very interested in India at this time, which is kind of funny, but India wasn't very interested in England. All right, this is kind of when the spice trade and you know the Europe is kind of finally getting involved in the spice trade. Um, he would have received, you know, paintings and stuff like that. So he kind of put them in like, yeah, I'm worldly, I'm cultured, but ultimately I prefer the Sufi mystic. But it's very significant that in the bottom is Vistir, who's, he's wearing yellow, he is Hindu, and he is important enough to be featured in this alongside the king. Oh, king James, excuse me, not Charles James. There's Ch Charles Henry's, there's all kinds of them, all right? So... Again, we have another example of, you know, this is Islamic. It does talk about Islam in it and the fact that the, the Mughals were Islamic, but it doesn't have anything to do with the fact of a religious message. So to show these figures was completely okay, including new little angels, which you never would have seen before. This is just amazing. Like they said that Victor could draw hands exceptionally well, which is maybe how he got hired to do this is because of how well he did hands. Right? You can see here that he's touching this manuscript and the Sufi is giving it to him, but almost with his hands, but he is just using a thin silk. So I just think this is kind of some other elements of it that are distinct. So the Ottoman Sultan has his hands together in deference. Um, it's not humility, like, like basically submission, but it is humility to this ruler of the Mughal empire and King James does have his hand near his sword because that was pretty typical to see in like European paintings, but it's not on the weapon, which shows he's no threat to Jahangir, right? And the if you look at the miniature, how well that little painting is done, it shows the little elephants um, and horses that maybe were a gift that he got in exchange for doing this painting, and his name is included in it, like that was allowed, and it's but it's he did get to sign it, but his name is on the footstool, which means he's like basically the footstool of the emperor, showing deference to him. Okay, I, there's all kinds of <laughs> crazy interpretations of this, but like, why is the angel on top crying? Is it because of Jahangir is so awesome he's crying, or is it because his time as ruler is running out? We don't know. There's all kinds of interpretations of this. 
I just think this is kind of cool. This is another one of those miniatures that shows Jahangir actually going through and talking to people of different religions. And he had people document it to show that he's kind of going out and like talking to these other, you know, groups within his empire to show that he was open to all religions. And unfortunately, they're not all going to be that way because one of the later rulers, Aurangzeb, is going to remove this policy of religious tolerance and forces Islam on everybody and basically down their throat. And that is one of the things that has led to conflict between Muslims and Hindus to this day because the British, when they come into India, exploit that. So one of the most famous works of art in the world is the Taj Mahal, which a lot of people think because it does look like an Islamic mosque is in somewhere in the Middle East, but it's not. It's in India. And this is actually built by a Shah because remember Persia was ruled by Shahs. So naturally the Mughals who are Persian Mongols are going to call their ruler Shahs too. This was built for a Shah of the Mughal dynasty who lost his child or lost his wife while she was giving birth to their 14th child. So the ta when you say something's a Taj Mahal, we call it like a labor of love, basically. And there's so much about this that shows this mixture of cultures, all right? So this Taj Mahal, it's considered the teardrop on the river because it was in sadness, but it still combines so much of Persian, um, Indian, Hindu, Mughal, and Muslim, like it is so much of a combination. All right, and so we're just gonna kind of um, pick this apart. One thing that you can't see is that the interior has eight levels um, inside, which would have represented like the eight different levels of paradise. So you have the seven gardens and the eight different levels. It is entirely made of marble, and that would have been to show off the wealth of the Mughals, which it was made using silver that they had acquired through trade from the New World. And basically this helped to kind of bankrupt India at the time, and that really upset the people there, so it really wasn't a very good move. Um, you can see that surrounding it are minarets, but this is not a mosque. It is a tomb, so please get that because there will be some confusion there. The front of it is actually done in an Ewan style because they are Persian, and Persian-style mosques were Ewan style based on the you know palaces that they used to have. And you'll notice that dome is much more of a rounded Persian dome. So that's a much better picture here, all right? Marble was actually a Persian influence that probably actually came from the time of Alexander the Great's influence. So that's something that you would kind of see there. Now, if you look, you've got one of those serene, calm ponds there that would have made this thing look limitless, like would have made it look almost weightless and floating. But these four rivers are kind of like the four rivers of Islamic paradise because hopefully the Shah's wife was in paradise after 14 children. She better be. And then you've got the gardens that surround it. So the rivers feed the gardens and this idea of paradise. Now here's what's kind of crazy. So to get into the Taj Mahal, this is the main gateway, right? Now you'll see here it has the Arabic tessellation. It has the Arabic calligraphy. It has the floral vegetative patterns. Then it has the Persian E1 style, right? So that big open entrance right there. But you'll notice that the color is red. And that's because in the Hindu world, red is the color of guardians. So this gate is a Hindu color because it represents the guardianship because this is in India to show that this is guarding that very sacred Islamic tomb in the back so that people in the Hindu world would recognize that this is a place of guardianship. So they call it a single tear suspended on the edge of time. And what is terrible today is actually that the um, the pollution in India is so bad, and especially along the rivers, that the Taj Mahal is turning green. Um, it's actually so nasty. And there's trash piling up everywhere. And because it's Islamic, the people of India are refusing to do anything about it. They're just kind of hoping that it gets destroyed. And if it gets dirty enough, they'll tear it down because it's you know just a disgrace and disgusting. And um, just another fun point, the Taj Mahal could have been seen from the palace so that the, the Shah could see it at all times and remember his wife. But do remember, Hindus and Muslims had a little bit of an issue at this point that still continues into this day because of Mughal suppression and the Islamic suppression of the people there. That's why we have Pakistan, because Pakistan was created as an Islamic nation for people fleeing India to basically get out of that area. So from this aerial view, you can really see it all. So you can see here the uh, gar the guardian entrance. It's the red color. You would go through that E1. You see the four rivers, all right, that are garden like divided into the different gardens. 
that are in there. And then you have, of course, this. So, and there's um, verses from the Quran talking about paradise and, you know, things like that. Here's what's crazy. The calligrapher, we know this, was actually a Persian from Iran, right? So they brought in somebody from Persia to do the lettering because they didn't want this to be messed up. It's very, very important. You can see around it all of the beautiful calligraphy and verses on it and how beautiful the tessellation is in the, not the tessellation, excuse me, the arabesques and how beautiful those are and kind of the reflection of the beauty of the, the queen herself. These are his and her tombs um, with their faces facing towards Mecca. And you can see that even though it was built for her, um, it was actually he's put up higher because she is lower because she is a woman. So what's crazy about it is the, um, the Taj Mahal was actually based off of a tomb for another Mughal emperor, which is Humayun. And you can see here you've got the dome and you've got the E1s and lots more E1s that are on it. And this was built for a man by his widow. And you can see that it also has the walkways, the gardens of paradise, the water source with the rivers, but it's more in red because it's for a male. So it's much more warrior in nature. And that's just to show you that you can see those E1s very clearly there. And this is just you know, in Iran, that E1 style of like the mosques that they create. You can see that that's where that influence comes from in Iran and Persia, that the Mughals would also adopt that as well. Um, just to clarify, I just want to, because Aladdin, um, people tend to get this wrong. So in the movie Aladdin, they're singing the song Arabian Nights to kind of give you this idea that it started in Arabia. Well, let's be perfectly clear. This is the Sultan's palace, all right, in, like, in Arabia. That's actually more of a Mughal-style building, just to get that clear. And um, Jasmine, if she had dressed at all like she did at any given point in Arabia, she would have been a harem girl, which means she basically would have been like an exotic dancer or sex slave. So really... In order for her to dress like that, she would have had to be somewhere not Arabic. And she has a pet tiger that is named Raja, which means prince in India. And on top of that, she flies around on a Persian style rug. So I assert that Aladdin does not take place in Arabia. It actually takes place in Mughal, India. Prove me wrong. I'm just saying. Okay. So I'm going to stop there and we are now finished with the art of the Arabic Empire.